Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the continuation of this week's studies. Before we begin to open the word, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and for his direction that he will direct our studies, direct our thoughts, and direct our conversation in all ways and in all things. Shall we ask for his blessing? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you, to learn more of what you would have us to know at this time. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth, to be guided in the direction that you would have us to walk. We thank you for those that are here at this meeting today and for those that may have watched these meetings later. We ask now, Father, for your guidance and your direction. May your will be done. We need you. We need your spirit to open our minds, to guide our thoughts and our conversation. We need your, your angels to protect us. We thank you for these opportunities. We ask now, Father, for your blessing. Be with us, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, it is interesting to see multiple things that are going on currently by many of the learned theologians within the church. Now, we've been dealing with what Uriah Smith had written in his original publications dealing with the book of Daniel. Is there anything else that we need to address before we get further and return further into this study? Yes. So um, can you stop your share so I can share my screen here? Certainly. Thanks. Okay, so this is um, Daniel 11 and the Islam interpretation by Angel Manuel Rodriguez. And the, re the reason I bring this up, Loren and I were having a conversation uh, regarding uh, the Sabbath that uh, he had um, uh, Tim Rosenberg speaking at his church and presenting this interpretation that Islam is the king of the South. And, and I, I ran into that about 10 years ago, maybe nine years ago. This paper is from 2015, so maybe it was around nine years ago that that was going around the church. Um, and it seemed to me that that was really being presented almost in opposition to this movement, uh, that that's why people were interested in it. At least I know in Alberta, it was being pushed by the conference. and. Um, as an alternative interpretation over our understanding of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. From, from what I looked at at the time, and I don't remember all the details of it, how their reasoning, but it made no sense, right? The idea that you could just introduce Islam as the king of the South pretty much ignores just Miller's rules. I mean, just completely. Now, um, you can see here that uh, this guy angel. I, I, I like this first paragraph. You know, since the early years of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the interpretation of Daniel 11, 40 to 45 has been a subject of debate. The fact that the prophecy is about events that will transpire during the time of the end, some of which are still in the future, should make us cautious in our interpretation of the passage. Now, you know, I'm not really quite sure why people care about being cautious. I mean, it's as if there is some something lurking in the weeds that, you know, is going to jump out at us. I think we should be careful in the sense of that we are following the proper way of understanding God's word. I mean, we're not going to be go at things haphazardly. But I think there is sort of a fear of uh, within Adventism of looking at the future. That That's sort of what I gain from that that uh, sentence there. And he says, what we offer here is a possible way of reading the text. And, and this is the scholarly way of looking at things. I remember when I was in university that this was really the way that scholarship works is you, pro one is you always have to propose some, some new idea, right? So when you're writing and you're just presenting old ideas that everyone else has said in the past, 
it, it's not generally looked upon as interesting. You know, you want to have something new. Um, but also, you always put things out there and, and you, you share all the different other views and, and you, you try not to be too adamant about your view, right? You, you sort of have to give equal, equal footing for every other view. Uh, that's, that's sort of a, a polite way of doing it, I guess. Um, and then he says, it is in, it, in its interpretation, it is important to read the passage on its own terms and examine the flow of ideas and the author's intention. Now, you know, so all of these things, there's so much behind them. Now, to say to read a passage on its own terms, I'm not really sure what that means. I mean, obviously, anything you're reading, I mean, you need to understand it. But we understand that everything's written in a context of God's word. Examining the flow of ideas, obviously, we look at all of Daniel and all of Scripture to understand where where things fit. So there's a larger context. The author's intention. So the thing I dislike about that is who's the author? Is he speaking the author as being Daniel? Yeah. But Daniel's intention is not really what we're looking at. We're looking at God's intention, right? Correct. Yeah. Daniel, his intention, I mean, he's, he's the author's intention, if it's scripture, is to record what God is revealing to him. But often they treat the Bible as if it's just a book written by a person. So, I mean, we want to know what God's intention is. What is it that God was revealing to Daniel? And what is it God revealing to us? So you can see this sort of humanistic approach uh, to studying the Bible that that is this undercurrent of, uh, of biblical interpretation. And then he's going to go into this paragraph, which... Uh, you know, has these big words, and nothing wrong with big words. I use them sometimes. But uh, it, it's not really giving us a lot of information here. You know, from the methodological point of view, this is a linguistic, syntactical, and grammatical analysis of the text. So this, basically, he, what he presents is the historical grammatical method. And, um, of course, Linguistic, that has to do with the language that you're looking at. It's Hebrew. Syntactical, that has to do with the sentence structure. And then grammar, that is uh, the particular use of words, you know, looking at, uh, it's related to syntax, obviously. Um, grammar is related to a sentence. So, obviously, you look at the language of the text. And so then he says, we will spend time examining the Hebrew text and discussing the meaning of the terms used as well as relevant, relevant, relevant syntactical constructions, right? So the way the sentences are put together. I've also tried to determine whether there is an Old Testament narrative that could provide a parallel or that could function as a conceptual background to the apocalyptic narrative found in, the te in our text. If such narrative is available, it can be used to understand the activity and intentions of the king of the north. I believe that the story of the exodus from Egypt provides enough terminological connections, images, and conceptual parallels. So um, he's going to look at Egypt as being the king of the south, obviously uh, has some relevance on the text in his mind, dealing with the exodus itself. Now, of course, what we know is we use line upon line. We take all of the stories of Scripture and we see the parallels that that exist. So obviously he doesn't have that concept of Millerite history as being um, a template in which we examine all stories. So he's not going to really understand uh, the time of the end in 1798 and the time of the end in 1989. You know, all of these different different things. So... Anyway, to bring this up, just because we had discussed it, um, but I, I do think I'm going to look through and uh, maybe, you know, sort of report on what this paper says. I, I just haven't read it yet. I just, you know, downloaded it. But, but one thing we can say is that there are lots of different interpretations. And this movement has been guided by God, I believe, with this understanding of Millerite history. And 
and we know in 1989 that Jeff had this understanding uh, come to him that there's this repeat of Millerite history. And, and that led to the understanding of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, um, that, that we have presently. And, and I do think it is extremely important that we, we understand it and how to present it to others in the, the mire of all these various interpretations, be able to show them the weaknesses and, and the, and, and the basically the faulty assumptions that they're using in, in approaching that, the, these, these scriptures. So in the, in the paper that I'm putting together, because you've been working on it, the, the paper on Daniel, Daniel's last vision, it is such a broad um, topic, Daniel chapter 10 to 12, that it ties together so many different things from scripture. Um, and so many truths are connected to it. It's, it. it's just unfortunate that there's so much darkness within Adventism and within Adventism scholarship about how to study the Bible, just how to use Miller's rules. So anyway, I just thought I'd share that. You can go back to what you were doing, unless somebody has comments about it. Well, there were a couple of comments in the in the chat, okay. one of which is that Brother Agrigas does not really address the methodology. And then another was that we should refer to Acts 17, 19 to 21. Now, is that basically so that we would we would call to mind the method in which we are studying? No, I was just comparing the, the scholars to the to the people in Greece that just wanted to talk about trivia all the time. Some new thing. You know, let's discuss this. Let's just have a bunch of rumors and analyze them. Okay. Now. As we, yeah, I don't, as, fi- I don't, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I don't find his approach reverent. If that makes sense. So you don't, you, you're not finding Rodriguez's approach reverential. Yeah, it's like here we're going to apply our intellect to this this document that was written by a man, and and we're we're going to study it like we would any uh, any document. Right. right. That that's that that's the historical grammatical method. Right. What 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 was the author intending? Uh it would be like I'm 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 studying um you know, Pride and Prejudice or something. <laughs> you know, some work of literary fiction and uh not the word of God. Well in this in this type of situation, let's also recall that the mother of harlots places themselves above the word of God. Mm -hmm. So are the daughters doing anything different than the mother? No. And yeah, when they started treating the Bible, like they were looking at just any sort of document, instead of saying, this is God speaking to Daniel and to us through Daniel, Right, so basically, God in times past spake unto the fathers by the prophets, right? Um, and then Christ comes in these last days. God spoken to us by His Son. We also look at um, in Revelation chapter one, you know that it's God sends His angels to speak to us, to speak to John about the things that are shortly to come to pass. Right. So we're sort of taking it like. Daniel has just written this book, and he's it's we're treating it like a man wrote it instead of uh, a revelation given by God. It, it, you know, I, I have a problem with that because I never have approached the Bible that way. Right. Never approached the Bible as just some sort of document. It's God speaking to me and and to everyone, but but to me first of all. Because if, if it's not God speaking to me, um, then then I have no point in reading it. And then if it and if it's not God speaking to everyone else, then then I have no point in sharing anything that I find from God's word. So 
Yeah. This goes back to this question, you know, that Felix has asked me you know, a number of times and we've discussed it. You know, what is the purpose of this chronology? Because, you know, because I love the view that, you know, what, what we have done in, in our studies is, is not the be all end all of everything. I mean, God has given this movement a purpose. He's given each of us a purpose in, in understanding his word in the way that we do. And I, and I believe that Adventists definitely can be benefited by what we have done, what God has shown us, but we don't have control over any of that. We don't know ultimately how God is going to work. All I know is that God shows us things, and we have a responsibility to share those things that we find in his word. And I find that there is more uh, you know, within the church, within the scholarship, but it's more about people, it's more about when they're sharing things, it's more about them than it is about God. And maybe that's just me being a bit critical uh, of others, but that's the impression I get so much, is it's like I have found something or I have this idea. And, you know, when, when I approached, you know, when I first became an Adventist and I approached you know, doing sermons and stuff, um, I didn't understand the, the 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 solemn responsibility of doing a sermon. You know, I was just a young guy, and it was like, you know, you go up and you share some things that you you thought about. As time went on, I became to I came to realize that um, I had to present the truth. It wasn't just that I presented something I thought. I was actually to present the words of life to those that are in the darkness of the shadow of death. And and so if you have to be pointing that person to God, not to you as a person. And, you know, and I figured this out fairly early on, thankfully. And part of it is I saw that so many people were drawing attention to themselves when they were speaking. And I, I found that rather distasteful. And so I examined myself, am I in that way? And And so, you know, always we are to direct people to God's word and to God. The Holy Spirit is the interpreter. We're not the interpreter of God's word. The Holy Spirit that inspired the gospel gospel writers, the the gospel, the Bible writers, is the one that interprets scripture. And so we have to point people to God. So, So when it comes to this question of what is it that, you know, the benefit of chronology, it's not up to me to decide. You know, how we've studied, all we have done, we've just followed God's leading. And how God's going to use what we have found is totally up to God, not up to us. Now, it also is our responsibility to ask God, what is it he wants us to do? Which which I've done all through this, this time, you know, since, you know, my, my Christian experience. But also in this time, dealing with... Uh, you know, from 2018 and, and onward, before that even, but, you know, as we dealt with this these time settings, so to speak, you know, November, November 9th, July 18th, what is it that God wants us to do? And then as we pass July 18th, well, what is our responsibility? You know, we end up doing these studies, and God just keeps telling us, continue studying and wait upon him, where... You know, what man wants to do is figure out, well, what is it I want to do? We we figure out, uh, you know, we saw that in the movement, the Carpenter's movement and Tavo and, you know, wanting to start their own church. Were they really listening to God or were they just figuring out, well, this is what we want to do because we, you know, we want to be in charge of the movement. And and, and so but I think there's there's something that, at a seventh day Adventist, we always have been missing. And I think that Angel Manuel Rodriguez sort of embodies that that sort of thinking. I run into it everywhere I turn on social media. That there isn't this what is it that God is saying to us sort of question. How should we understand this? It's it's more I understand that this way you should agree with me. And I think that, that and, or, you know, as Angel Man Rodriguez, 
I mean, he's going to soften that a little bit. You know, I, I'm just putting this up tentatively. But really, he is saying, as all scholars are really saying, because it's just the polite manner in which they write. Um, I, I came up with this idea. I understand things this way. And you should think like I think. Instead of us really approaching, what is it that God's trying to say to us? Um, you know, this has really been pressed in my mind you now the time that I've been here in Australia. That um, it's becoming clearer to me, you know, as we're, we're doing these studies, what it is that we're actually doing. We're trying to find out God's direction for us personally, for our day to day plans. And, and so we're not studying here to just tease the intellect. We're not here to, um, you know, be puffed up with knowledge to somehow beat other people in the debate. And, and often people treat us as if that's what we are doing. And, and I, I was wondering why, why is that? And, and the only thing that I can think is that that's the way they approach things. Because I've had so many people, you know, they just always accuse accuse us of because they disagree with us. We must be proud because we don't agree with them about whatever it is. And and you know, that, that, I'm not sure why why people would think that just because somebody disagrees with you, it means they're proud. It it, it to me is always very puzzling. I think it's it has to do with how they look at things. To them, the knowledge of the scriptures or how they look at an interpretation of the text is a matter of pride. Because they think that mentally and intellectually they're so much more superior? Well, they think that that's what everyone is doing, right? The, the whole reason we're studying the Bible is to show that we're smarter than everyone. The reason why we come up with an interpretation in their minds is because we're trying to show we're better than somebody else. And Never is there that idea or thought in my mind when I'm studying the Bible. I just want to know what God is saying. I'm not in competition with any human being. And yet that's the way I think that people are approaching it. That it's sort of a, a competition. And, and, and you see that all the time on Facebook discussions. I mean, it's, you know, it's like who is right. And I've never approached things that way. But it's really difficult when people are approaching things that way to have a conversation, to actually study the Bible together. Yeah, and, 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 and the question, I guess, because we're studying right now Uriah Smith, does Uriah Smith have sort of that attitude in that, that sense of who's right and who's wrong? Um, I know when I read uh, Uriah Smith's book, um, on the state of the dead. What's the title of that book? You know the book I'm talking about, anybody? You can find it quickly. Not totally familiar with it. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I, when when, when I first became an Adventist, I read his book. What's that? Well, I'm the yeah, I'm I'm not. Not. Oh. oh, I just uh, say I I didn't know he wrote any other books besides Daniel Revelation. Oh, yeah, he wrote a lot of stuff. Oh. Um, yeah, so hey, you know, lots of books. I mean, I think you mentioned it before. I can't remember. Oh, I think. I I never it. mentioned it. No, I never mentioned his book. Unconditional. Uh, it's called here. I just thought I saw it. I know I've heard it somewhere before because I, I brought to mind when, when you mentioned it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, when I read the book, I just had a bad taste in my mouth. It was very argumentative. So, anyway, um, I just can't remember the title. Anyway, Dwight, you can I find the title. I'll let you know. Uh, there's a book you wrote called Modern Spiritualism. Yeah, it's not the book. That's it's just a different title of it now. That's not the book. Mortal or Immortal, which? Yes. Maybe it's that one. Could be that one. Yeah. Anyway, it was very, very argumentative. And, and I didn't like that style. You know, a bit mocking, which, which I'm not a fan of. 
that Smith does seem to have that kind of an attitude in a lot of things that he's written. Yeah. Which is one of the reasons I just never liked reading Uriah Smith. I mean, I've read Daniel and Revelation, but I, I didn't read a lot of his books because I read the one on you know, what happens when you die. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just found, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't approach somebody that way if I was trying to convince them of something. You know, it's it's like, I mean, who, who's going to want to be sort of bullied in, in order to understand uh, truth? I mean, you're, you're basically going to set that person, um, you know, he, he's not going to be convinced because you, you're, you're just making fun of him. Um, I don't think it's a very productive way of communicating to somebody. So usually what you're trying to do is, is somebody who agrees with you read the book, and then what you're doing is you're 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 setting in that person a spirit, which is that spirit that I dislike. That sort of that we're opposed to other people who don't think like we do. And you know when we when we're sharing the truth, we're not, we're not opposed to a person. I mean, we should be the opposite of opposed to a person. We should be interested in that person's salvation. And sharing truth because um, a person needs to hear the truth, and, and we share our experience of what God has done in our lives, and and why we think the truth is valuable. But to to attack that person, I don't see it as as productive. I mean, I know it's a it's a common way that people address you know things on YouTube as well, you know. Um, you know, I can't remember the words, you know, like people slaughter somebody or they own them or uh, everybody's uh, uh, debunking somebody or whatever, right? And and so this sort of intellectual competition, I, I don't think has anything to do with the gospel. Agreed. Okay. We covered yesterday Smith's comment that it may be objected that those who engaged in this movement were disappointed in their expectations. So were the disciples of Christ at his first advent in a tenfold degree. They shouted before him as he rode into Jerusalem, expecting that he would then take the kingdom. But the only throne to which he then went was the cross, and his royal palace was Joseph's new sepulcher. Nevertheless, they were blessed in receiving the truths that they heard. They were blessed even when they didn't understand the truths at that time. Is that any different from what we had seen on July 18th? And have we not been blessed since July 18th in the studies that have been ongoing? Smith continues, it may be objected further that this was not a sufficient blessing to be marked by a prophetic period. Does every blessing have to be marked by a prophetic period? Why not, he continues, since the period in which it was to occur, namely the time of the end, is introduced by a prophetic period since our Lord in verse 14 of his great prophecy of Matthew 24 makes a special announcement of this movement. And since it is still further set forth in Revelation 14, 6, and 7 under the symbol of an angel flying through mid-heaven with a special announcement of the everlasting gospel to the inhabitants of earth. Surely the Bible gives great prominence to this movement. We do not, we do not half realize its blessedness and importance. Two more questions are to be briefly noticed. What are the days referred to in verse 13, and what is meant by Daniel standing in his lot. Those who claim that the days are the 1335 are led to that application by looking back no further than to the preceding verse, where the 1335 days are mentioned, whereas in making an application of these days so indefinitely introduced, we think the whole scope of the prophecy should be taken from chapters, from chapter 8. Chapters 9, 10, 11, and 12 are clearly a continuation and an explanation of the vision of chapter 8. 
so that we may say that in the vision of chapter 8, as carried out and explained, there are four prophetic periods, namely the 2300, the 1260, the 1290, and the 1335. The first is the principal and longest period. The others are but intermediate parts and subdivisions of this. Are we in agreement with what Smith has said here? Well, so he, he is correct. We need to go back to chapter 8. Okay. In chapter 8, the topic is the kazone. There are, well, there's two, right, two, two visions, the kazone and the mara, right? So we have the, the 2520 and the 2300 days. Or pardon me, not the mara, the evenings and mornings, right. which is uh, the mara. Right, the vision of the evenings and the mornings, which is the 2300 days. So we have the Kazone. And if you don't understand that, it becomes really difficult to understand even what, because we've taken the position that Daniel 10, 11, and 12 is God revealing to Daniel a further understanding of the Kazone. That's the thing that he, at this point, has not understood. He's understood the Morar. And he's understood the Dabar, Daniel chapter 9, the 70 weeks. But he needs an understanding of the Kazone. And, and that's what's being given, right? But that is introduced in chapter 8. But he seems to miss out on that because he's got the 1260, the 1335, the 1290, and the 2300 days. And it is true that the 1260 is part of the Kazone, right? So if he had understood uh, the 2520, then he would see that Daniel 12, verse 7, was addressing the first part, that is the first end of the indignation, and then the last end of the indignation is going to be addressed by the 1290 and the 1335, in connection with the time, times and a half of, of Daniel uh, 7, verse 25. So he, he's missed this, this piece of the puzzle, but it is right under his nose. Uh, there's a, an author called Jack Dukan. Have you ever heard of him? Uh, Jack, uh, what was last name? I think it's like du, Dukan. I think he's like a French Algerian. Uh, yes. He used to be a Jew. Yes, yes. I, I, I am familiar. I've run into his, his stuff. Because uh, he writes on prophecy, and um, I've seen some of his books at the ABC. Um, but I haven't read any of them. Uh, I think I may have read part of one of his books. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. So, so you bring him up so, that for. Yeah. So in, yeah, 2009, so yeah, in 2019, uh, he, there was a, a book published called Daniel 11 Decoded. And, yeah. Um, he, what he did was he looked at Daniel chapter 8 and seen that as like a template for Daniel chapter 11. And what mm-hmm. he does is when you're reading Daniel chapter 8, it's like uh, you have the literal aspect, you have the Medo Persia and then Greece with the, the ram and the goat. And then it mm-hmm. doesn't really dwell much in Rome as in pagan Rome, it kind of just merges in the sense from Greece, it kind of merges into the little horn. And mm-hmm. uh, and so there you have like a spiritual, you're now after the cross with, with the papacy being the little horn and you have like a spiritual application there that's moved from the literal kingdoms of you know, the physical to like a spiritual kingdom. With the papacy. Mm-hmm. So what what he does with Daniel 11 is he'll start off with you have the Greece, you have Medo Persia initially, uh, Cyrus, and the, I think he he makes some mistakes with the three kings that stands up. I don't think he recognizes uh, Smyrdas. I think he uh, goes to Artaxerxes as the the fourth far richer than them all, rather than yeah. Xerxes. I think, yeah, and he's also using a, a much more uh, new view of the daily then. Like he wouldn't have the pioneer view of the daily, he wouldn't have the two desolating powers. I wouldn't think it, no. Yeah. 
Yeah, because I, I remember think, looking yeah. at some stuff, and 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 it was just too too um, intellectual, scholarly, and just missing so many different things. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, he's creative in in some ways, but uh, again, you know this. So I think you know the thing that because we bring up this 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 idea that we have. This movement has been just like the Millerite movement. It was there for a purpose with the opening of the little book, right? Mm -hmm. You know, this the unsealing of the, the seven seals, and then this little book is opened, and, and that's Millerite history. We have that movement. And, and of course, this movement's founded upon the repeat of Millerite history in our time, that this movement was part of Bible prophecy. Uh, to unseal the seven thunders, that is to understand Millerite history. So within Adventism, we have this experience, Millerite history, and we lost an understanding of Millerite history. And so this movement was raised up to understand Millerite history. And so we're not just people who are, you know, uh, fishing in the dark, you know, for some kind of way to understand Daniel chapter 11, verse 40 to 45, just so, you know, it's our intellectual curiosity. We believe that this movement is just as much God-led as was the Millerite movement. That's why it's so unfortunate when God led this movement in the proclamation of July 18, 2020, and then we're disappointed that we just deny God's leading in the first place. And so, so I, I guess it's just continually being pressed upon my mind over the last couple of weeks, just what it is we're doing in these studies. And, and maybe just a little bit, you know, me not leading out and, and uh, you know, Dwight leading out and where the direction that it's gone is you can see so much that. And, and the topics we're studying, it, it's just it's just striking my mind how much God has led in our understanding of his word through the experience that we had and that we are still having. That it, it, it isn't about something intellectual and detached from us. It is about the experience that, that we are presently in. So it, to me, it's just very powerful uh, once once you have that perspective. You know, we're not studying, yeah. studying about the nations. We're studying about us, what, what God is speaking to us and how he's using us presently. Yeah. I would agree with your description of him being creative with what he does, you know, after the kingdom of Greece and paralleling that with Daniel chapter 8 then it goes into a little horn. And so when it talks about the king of the north and the king of the south, he's going to put that into the, a spiritual application. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, as if it skips, basically skips over pagan Rome. As, mm -hmm. uh, sort of, as what some of Daniel 8 would maybe do. And uh, so what he'd have then is, is the king of the south, he'd represent that. Have that as like the secular power, secular. Mm -hmm. So maybe with secular, um, the Rome, Roman power, and so the, and the king of the north mm -hmm. end would be uh, the the spiritual aspect with the papacy. Yeah. And and so and so when it says in like in Daniel five, the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes shall be strong above him. So that's in a sense the papacy rising up out of uh, pagan Rome. And then uh, at the end of years, it talks about this year marriage. And so he's uh, he's sort of like saying that's like a church and state being formed. Uh, so he, mm. you're, he's taking it around the, uh, yeah. yeah, whatever. With, he mentions that. Yeah, a lot of that's in the tense tenor of Revelation 12. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, with people like Roy Allen Anderson and, and different interpretations, for instance, of, um, you know, the seven heads 
uh, people tend to want to move into these sort of what they call a spiritual application, but I don't think they're actually applying it correctly in how we we look at something that's you know type and anti-type in that way. It spiritual almost just becomes this open-ended imaginative way of of applying things that that do, isn't really founded on anything solid. Uh huh. Yes. So I haven't looked at the whole book. I've just kind of got up to a certain page, whatever, maybe about a third of the way through. So yeah. um, just sort of get skipping over areas because some of it's just to sort of get an idea of what he's thinking anyway. Yeah. And, and, and I think there, you know, there's a place for understanding what other people are thinking. Because one is you want to be able to know how to communicate to them what what things the way that i look at it when i when i listen to someone is is i want to understand what their thinking is what their basic assumptions are and and what i need to present to them to help them to see things differently and not that you know we necessarily be, be necessarily be able to talk to that guy personally but to other people who are influenced by his book so you know so there is a point of understanding others but primarily, we need to understand the truth for ourselves um, and be affected by it so that we can affect other people in a positive way. But, uh, yeah, I know when I looked at his books, I wasn't really too impressed. But, but I, I didn't see that one because you said it was 2019. I, I think I was looking at his books on um, Revelation, his commentary on, on uh, trying to remember which, uh, I can't remember. What, what it was. Maybe it was just on, on Daniel chapter 8. But anyway, it was, it was a while ago. Uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago when I seen one of his books at the ABC. Was, that would be the last time I was at the ABC. Uh -huh. Dwight? Yep, still here. So we have all of these different viewpoints that many of these learned theologians are trying to bring out regarding these prophetic periods but all of them are adrift when they are removed from the understanding as miller had of the seven times smith in his statement that the first and principal and longest period the others are but intermediate parts and subdivisions of this now the graph the the chart that that brother stephen had provided on friday and so many others that, that he's been led to provide have given us some great understanding of exactly how we should be looking at this with the 1290, with the 1335, and with so many others. This is truly finding light and gathering additional rays of light. Smith yeah. continues. And this kind of reminds me of people's interpretation of uh, Great Controversy, page 351, where Ellen White talks about the last and longest prophetic period brought to view in the Bible. Right. And they just assume that it's the 2300 days. Because she, but when she says that the 70 weeks and the 2300 days are both a different portion of the same great prophetic period, uh, we know that the 2300 days is not a portion of itself. Right. And... Uh, so, and, and, and actually, when you look at the languages of what she's saying, because she's going to talk about um, the, the last and longest, she's going to talk about uh, three different periods, actually. She's going to be uh, talking about, uh, the, but, well, four altogether. But when she first introduces it, um, she, uh, I'm just trying to find the statement here, because it's, Better if I actually read it. It's a great controversy. Uh, 351. Yeah, I know it's 351. I just got to find the, the page there so I can. Yeah, so it's um, the experience of the disciples who preached the gospel of the kingdom at the first advent of Christ had its counterpart in the experience of those who proclaim the message of the second advent. The one thing you see here is the disappointment of. Uh, the disciples and the disappointment of the Millerites, they are connected. And this we, we've actually addressed already in this, this section. As the disciples went out preaching, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. So Miller 
and his associates proclaimed the longest and last prophetic period brought to view in the Bible was about to expire. That's the 2520. That the judgment was at hand. That's the 2300 days. And that the everlasting kingdom was to be ushered in. That's the 1335. The preaching of the disciples in regard to time was based upon the 70 weeks of Daniel 9. And the message given by Miller and his associates announced the termination of the 2300 days, of which the 70 weeks form a part. So the 70 weeks is a part of the 2300 days. The preaching of each was based on a fulfillment of a different portion of the same great prophetic period. Now, the way that some people try to get around this is they say, well, the Millerites just proclaimed uh, the last portion of the 2300 days. And the, the disciples preached the first portion of it. But if we're going to see that the preaching of each was based upon a fulfillment of a different portion of the same great prophetic period, we can't really say that, that the Millerites only proclaimed the last portion of the 2300 days. They proclaimed the 2300 days, right? The end of it. But still, these are both a different portion of same great prophetic period that she has referred to earlier, which is the last and longest, which is the 2520. And if you compare this to uh, a statement by Sylvester Bliss, where he he um, addresses this, he, he clear he, he's using almost the same sort of language uh, to talk about the 2520, the 2300 days, the 1335, and then and then he will talk about how the 70 weeks. And the 2300 days are, are, are part of, I can't remember the words he uses, um, he doesn't use different portion, but basically something similar to that, analogous with that, of the 2520. So in, in a sense, she's, she's using that same description that he's using. And then also in, uh, in uh, Great Controversy, and, and it's, it's a bit earlier, she's going to quote from Miller's uh, study, which which is found in in Miller's memoirs, page seventy four. I remembered, of course, because early writing seventy four, but it's page seventy four. She's going to quote from it, um, where she talks about the various prophetic periods, and and he lists them as the twenty five twenty, the twenty three hundred days, and the thirteen thirty five. Right? Because of course the the you know the seven times in Leviticus. 26, but instead of the 2520. So, so uh, again, you know, Smith has missed out on this, and Adventism has missed out on this. So it actually becomes extremely important. I mean, if we're going to understand the foundation of Adventism, and we're going to move forward, we're going to build upon it. Um, we need to see that that foundation is correct. And so Smith has missed out on that. He's missed out on this 2520. And because of that, because the church has missed out on this, not just Uriah Smith personally, it opened up the door for all these various interpretations uh, that we see in Adventism today regarding prophecy. Um, it opens up the door for the new view of the daily, for instance, and then all the things that result from that. So the, the prophetic confusion in Adventism is, in a simple sense, just a lack of understanding of how we got to October 22nd, 1844 in the first place. Well, the one thing that I've stated multiple times in reading and going through things that Smith had presented is it's brought me to the point where I can reason more clearly from cause to effect. Smith's situation because of the way in which he learned to study as a youth, valued his own opinions above that of others. And in this situation, he viewed himself as being more highly trained than, let's say, a James White. Now, here we have situations that Smith is attempting to address, but he is again setting aside the lens 
of the seven times that Miller had used in viewing all of the prophetic periods. So when Smith continues, now when the angel tells Daniel at the conclusion of his instructions that he shall stand in his lot at the end of the days without specifying which period is meant, would not Daniel's mind naturally turn to the principal and longest period, the 2300 days, rather than to any of its subdivisions? Smith, in a manner of looking at this, is now coming back, as you were talking about earlier, trying to address what is on Daniel's mind rather than what is God's purpose. Do you have a problem with that statement? I think it's often how we, you know, we, we approach it, not, not just scholars and, and so forth. We, we, we approach the scriptures irrelevant, irreverently, you know, and, and maybe sometimes it's just the language we use but we're not really thinking about it. But yeah, I would think that sometimes that that, that, that definitely occurs. That we, we sort of are above God's word. We're, we're analyzing God's word as if somehow we are interpreting it rather than allowing the Holy Spirit to interpret it. And um, that we're treating Daniel as a person with his ideas just as we treat ourselves with our ideas. Right. So, you know, this is about God's word, God speaking to us. And, and I think that we're not able to really hear God because of that, because of our approach. We don't really hear him speaking to us through his word. We're sort of imposing upon his word our ideas. And, and I think Smith, Smith suffers from that, just as many of us do. Okay. Now, Smith's point as he as he continues is if this is so the 2300 days are intended now our heavenly father has a purpose to show us these prophetic periods when we're looking at the 2300 the 1335 the 1260 the 1290 and the 2520 they are not just prophetic periods but they are also symbols Mm -hmm. when we look at the 2300, the only difference between it and the 2520 is a reduction by 220. Mm -hmm. And what is the symbol of 220? What does it mean to us? Well, it's a symbol of restoration. So if we're setting aside a symbol of restoration, is that like saying we're not really interested in in being restored into a full communion with God? I guess symbolically. Yeah. So when we set aside, when we're setting aside this 2520 and we are deciding to ignore the symbol of 220, we're almost the same as the others that are saying we're good enough. We're good people. We will be in heaven. And for me, that's a hard situation. Now, Smith, in continuing here states the reading of the Septuagint looks seems to look very plainly in this direction. But go thy way and rest, for there are yet days and seasons to the full accomplishment of these things. And thou shalt stand at thy lot at the end of the days. This certainly carries the mind back to the long period contained in the first vision in relation to which these subsequent instructions are given. So here is Smith attempting to show that He understands how to read Greek. And at the time in which he wrote this, it was not uncommon for Latin and Greek to yet be taught in schools. Yeah, they they actually learned Greek and Latin. My my dad did when he went to high school. Well, my, my thought process was going a little differently. I was thinking of an American president who could write Greek with one hand and Latin with the other simultaneously. Who was that? Uh, James Abram Garfield. Oh. Had he continued? I mean, what was interesting about this man, he, he had served as a general during the Civil War. He was elected. He was the 20th president of the United States. But while he was raised Protestant, he was at the point that 
before his assassination, he likely would have converted and become a Catholic, which would have surprised a lot of people because there were not many Catholics in higher office at that time. Why was he assassinated? He'd given a speech, and there was a disgruntled office seeker that was not very happy with the fact that he had not been appointed to some office within Garfield's administration. So he shot Garfield. Garfield survived for a number of days through the sweltering heat of Washington, D.C., and the doctors could not find the bullet, so it continued lodged in his system. But he was the 20th president of the United States, and he was elected in 1880 and served in 1881. Okay. He was one of the shortest serving of the American presidents. But how much use of the Septuagint did Miller make? Well, well none. I mean... I'm personally not um, a fan of using the Septuagint in any sort of, uh, and here it's, it seems sort of superfluous. I mean, it's not really telling us anything that the Hebrew isn't telling us that you could just refer to. So uh, I found that kind of odd. And then that's one of the things why we know that James White did not write uh, that article of January 26, 1864, against the 2520, because the author refers to Jesenius, which is something right. James White never does. Uh, it's something that Uriah Smith regularly does. Yes. Um, so, so it's pretty clear. Yeah, you know, James White is not going to be referring to Jesenius, and 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 the style is completely different than James White. But uh, so, I mean, we can't prove it's Uriah Smith, but we can definitely say it's not James White who wrote it. Um, but most likely with Uri Smith, it seems to be in his style. But yeah, it's, you know, so the Septuagint, it, it's, I, I, I don't see the value of it as the way modern scholarship does, because they try to say, well, because it's an old translation of the Hebrew, that it, it might tell us more about what the Hebrew actually says rather than just reading the Hebrew for ourselves. Right, um, right. But, uh, I haven't I haven't seen much advantage in the Septuagint as a translation. To me, it's like looking at the Latin uh, Vulgate or something like that to understand the Hebrew. Uh, just read the Hebrew, you know. But anyway, yeah. So, but there's nothing here that that, that this says that the Hebrew doesn't say. So I'm not sure why he would go to the Septuagint, it's, other than to sound like he's learned. Correct. Because in this in this type of a situation, Smith would want to present his credentials mm -hmm. that he understood the Greek. Now, William Miller, as some would say, a simple farmer, was not one that had been trained in either Greek or Latin. He had not been to the schools of those that believe themselves to be learned men. Smith had attended such a school and believed that upon his leaving that school, that he was well prepared for whatever employment was to come his way. Yeah, you know, I was kind of blessed in that way, having my dad who, you know, went to cemetery, I mean seminary, you know, to become a minister. Right. And to see how foolish he was when it came to the scriptures. And I don't mean to say it in a mean way about my dad, but he, he, he definitely believed that his education somehow made him superior uh, to me, his, his son, who was like a kid. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, the reality is, that God speaks to the simplest people and that truth that, that uh, you know, intellect has nothing to do with correctness and education has nothing to do with understanding. So, you know, it's something I learned early on. So when I, when I went to university, I mean, primarily went because I wanted to study music, but I did take religious studies. And um, I never imagined that somehow going to university and getting a degree 
made me qualified. And so I never looked to the school for, for certification. I just believe that, you know, every Christian is supposed to study God's word and learn from it. And that we're, 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 we're dependent upon God for understanding the Bible. And so I've never, never sought like recognition by the scholarly community as if somehow if they recognize me, then that means, you know, I've somehow made it. But a lot of scholars really look for that. I've run into people like uh, uh, this one guy from the Biblical Research Institute. You know, he definitely values the fact that he's a scholar, that somehow, and he thinks that other people want, you know, somehow to be, you know, to have their approval with their ideas. That's why he thought I was presenting what I presented to him. Somehow, if I got his approval, then then it was valid in some way. And, yeah, you know, so it's just, I don't really care what the scholar thinks. Well, from what I've seen from scholarship, it it's, it's, doesn't really have that much value unless that person is a truly converted Christian who understands and has a reverence for God's word. But often that's taken away from people once they go to school. Now, we have the, the opposite of that. There are people who somehow take pride in their ignorance and, and believe because, you know, somehow they're not a scholar uh, that we should listen to them. And their interpretation, and and that of course is just another species of the same error, right? Just because I'm unlearned doesn't mean I'm qualified either. But no one is really qualified other than the Holy Spirit to interpret God's word. Our responsibility is to listen to God's word and to live it out. But we're always dependent upon God, not just to understand for ourselves, but even into the, to share things with others. That the Holy Spirit has to speak to them as well, right? So just because God has spoken to me doesn't mean that now I'm the way in which truth is understood. It, you know, it has to go through me. I'm the interpreter. The Holy Spirit is still the interpreter. Even if I've it's revealed it to me, it's still the interpreter for each individual. And so the Holy Spirit has to do the work upon the heart of that individual. And if I have obey God's voice, if I have listened to him, then I might have an influence in helping that other person. But the Holy Spirit is the one that teaches him. None of us are being taught from any man. It's always the Holy Spirit that is is to teach us. But I understand, you know, people often want to look to man. Right? They want They want somebody to tell them what the Bible says instead of asking God directly doesn't mean that we don't need other people, because we do. Right? We have to share the gospel. But um, ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit that gives us an understanding of, of God's word, even if a man has shared it with us. Right. I wanted to comment, Theodore. I was thinking the other day about living in a Turner home, and you had mentioned the advantage that you had had in that in that regard and i and i thought you know i i was privileged to have some of that advantage uh having lived with your family there and one of the things that i got from that that i was thinking about was conversations with your father taught me a lot about being careful about my words considering each word and that and right down to the how i used a word uh, especially, I remember being cornered on the word they, T-H-E-Y. And I'd use that in talking with your dad, trying to prove my point. They say, they this, they that. And he'd stop me and he'd say, <laughs> well, who are they? And that really had me, that really made me think. I can't just say they. I have to say, you know, where is that information coming from? Not just they. So I I did learn that critical thinking skills. I think yeah. from well, talking with you. Yeah, dad. I understand. Yeah, but and the thing that it taught me is talking to my dad because I was always trying to communicate to him, right? And, and he had create, created all kinds of barriers of communication, right? You understand what I'm saying there, Kelly? 
you know, it, it yeah, was it was I, a battle yeah. <laughs> to 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 even figure out what he was saying. Um, um, it was he was yeah. extremely yeah. Uh, defensive and evasive. But but I was trying to understand him as a person. You know, one is because I loved him; he's my dad. But so that I could communicate with him things that were inside of me. And he didn't seem to have that much interest in actually listening to anyone else. But it didn't it didn't mm-hmm. uh, stop me from trying to figure out how to communicate with him. And so that's taught me a lot about communicating with other people. And one is that I listen to them. I want to understand what it is they're thinking. And, and if I can understand what they're thinking, then maybe I can communicate with them. And, and also I learned really that, you know, arguing with a person doesn't convince them of anything. <laughs> so, but yeah, it, it, yeah. I, I do find that there was there was a blessing in in the way that my dad was. Um, that uh, I didn't think of it as a blessing at, at the time, but it definitely has helped me a lot in in trying to understand other people and, and understanding myself as well. You know, what is it that I'm saying? What is it that I'm trying to, uh, to understand? So he was very analytical, but. Uh, the point of evading uh, reality. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, very analytical, right down to yeah, right down to punctuation and meanings of words. He, he yeah. seemed like he could go to really obtuse places just out of the <laughs> desire to not be cornered. Yeah, yeah. But I, I learned yeah. so much. I learned so much from him. Because of that, a lot of patience. He wasn't, he, and not, yeah, he was a caring. He was a caring person. He, he definitely so much. gave. That's, that's what that was. One of the frustrating things was he was quite sincere when he was speaking and very thoughtful and and so on. But just yeah, yeah. Anyway, I loved him. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see. Hey, Dwight. Yep, still here. Okay. We've got a few moments left before the close of today's session. Now, we've got a few paragraphs left to go over, plus a couple of other items that I have prepared. So at this point, are there any other thoughts or questions with what we have addressed so far today? Yeah, I was going to ask you a question, Dwight. Okay. What? Why I mean, why ain't I ever heard about that president being assassinated? Garfield? Yeah. Well, I just is... uh, I just curious. You have a way of bringing out history that I don't even know about. <laughs> well, my brother, when when I was when I was quite young, I was enamored with the study of American history, and. It stuck in my mind how many presidents had been assassinated, how many presidents had died in office. And when we start tying this to what we're seeing currently, it all becomes more and more relevant. Now, Lincoln, of course, was the first president to be assassinated, right? So he was assassinated in 1865 on as I as I seem to recall, during the first month of the biblical year, he may actually have been assassinated on the 14th day of the first month. I'd have to go back and look again. But he was the first. Garfield was the second. McKinley was the third. And all three of those had served either in the war or during the Civil War. John Kennedy, when he was assassinated in 1963, is the only president that had no connection with the Civil War that was assassinated to this point. We've had multiple presidents that have died in office for different reasons, the first of which was William Henry Harrison. And he was the shortest termed president because he died roughly 30 days after assuming office. Garfield is one of the, I think he was the second shortest, but I've, I've looked and studied these things most of my life and placing them in position with how they interrelate 
with what we're seeing within the Adventist church and within the movement has been intriguing for me. Yeah, it's kind of interesting how our little interests, you know, when we're young, how they have influenced us uh, in our study of God's word. Exactly. Later in life. I mean, all my little idiosyncrasies regarding, uh, you know, physics and mathematics and astronomy and, and so forth. I mean, to me, it was just curiosities, right? It was just things I was interested in and nobody else really was. Uh, but here, of course, they come to play in understanding chronology and my interest in calendars and numbers. Right. Um, so, so, you know, so God has used, you know, he, he put us through experiences, not just like, you know, my dad, for instance, that Kelly knew and, and, uh, and different experiences that we had. All of us have had these experiences that have shaped us. And we can see how God has used them, even the very uh, difficult experiences. He's used them to shape our characters, our intellect, um, our experience, so that um, we could be used by him in these last days. Pretty interesting. Right. But does that help answer your question, William? Yeah, it does. It does. It just shows me I I should have been studying my history like I was supposed to do when I was young, but I did. But anyway... Don't, don't don't feel bad about it. When when I was a junior in high school, my history teacher would get frustrated because I would come into class every morning and fall asleep immediately. Yet I was acing the class. I got straight A's in the class, in the quizzes and everything else. He never knew that I'd had that same history book in another class many years before. And I'd read it cover to cover in a, in a few short months because I enjoyed it so much. Okay. Any other comments or thoughts? I see from the chat that Lincoln's assassination was the 18th day of the first month of 1865. So that was, so that was May, May 7th, 1863? No. What was the date? I believe it's April 14th, 1865. Okay. So if it's April 14th. April 15th. Yeah, and he was shot on the 14th and died on the 15th. Okay. Yeah, so that's going to be the 26th day of the 13th month, or on the rabbinic calendar, the 26th day of the first month. Right, so there is an uh, extra month that you in the biblical calendar, what I have here. I'm just going by the calendar converter. Me too. Interesting. Let's look at this. 1863, April 15th? No, 1865. Oh, 65. Well, that's what I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was thinking 1963 with uh, <laughs> Lincoln, that's why. Oh, yeah, 1865. So, uh, yeah, so that's going to be the 18th day of the first month, the 15th. Okay. The 17th day of the first month is the day he would be shot. Um, what time of day was he shot? In the evening. Yeah, so then it'd probably still just be the 18th on the biblical calendar. Right. That's better. Okay. Okay. So shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the conversation and for all of the input that has come in this study today. We ask now, Father, for your blessing through this day. Help those that need to rest, to rest. Help those of us that need to work, to do the work that you would send us. Help us to be directed so that it's your character that may be glorified in all that we do. For this, Father, we thank you, and in this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.